if we're running away from something and not stepping up and dealing with it, it's going to show up and it's going to be a baggage that holds you back. It's going to be that psychic debris that just makes it so hard to see and think clearly. Have you found that with your own clients as well? Oh, certainly. I think to a certain degree, I saw a lot of this. This is probably like 10 years ago when I was running a lot of marathons, specifically that because when I saw people who were really great like endurance runners, they were like fell into like one of three camps. They're either running from something, running towards something, or they were just like living in the moment. And those in the moment seemed to be the happiest. Those who were running from something had like this like anger about them, like they were like fearful as they were running versus those who were running towards something where it felt like they were like ambitious and like fighting for something they didn't have. What's up, my friend, and welcome back to another episode of the Legendary Life Podcast. I'm Ted Rice, health expert and your host for this show. I'm coming to you from Bangkok, Thailand today, which you're probably a little bit tired of hearing that name, right? I've been here off and on for the past two years, but that's all going to be changing drastically soon because I'm on my way back to the United States to see my dad, to spend some time with him, get him hooked up with some physical therapy, to bring him all the gifts that I've bought him from the past year in Asia. And also I've got a new journey coming, a new adventure coming in a new part of the world. And I'm going to be sharing more about that later. But today I am super excited to announce that my friend, Jeff Sanders, my friend and fellow podcaster, Jeff Sanders is back on the show. If you don't know Jeff, he's a host of the 5 a.m. Miracle podcast. In fact, many of you came from his podcast and started listening to Legendary Life as a result. And what a cool thing because Jeff and I, reconnect here and catch up and talk about the biggest lessons that we've learned in 2019. Actually, since we've last talked and Jeff's been on the show several times, I've been on his podcast several times. So you're going to hear a very honest conversation about the struggles of you know my life and Jeff's life. And I want to do more episodes like this. So I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Now, before we get to the episode, I want to say this. If you haven't watched my masterclass and you are looking to lose fat and to optimize your energy levels, listen, I've been helping people with that since 1999 and I've never been better. And I share with you my top strategies in my free masterclass. There's one for men, there's one for women. It's free and there's nothing that pops up where you have to buy something or or not even that you have to buy anything. There's nothing for sale on it. It's not a thing that I trick you into watching it so that I can, you know, sell you something for 37, $37.97 or whatever, or $97.37. It's free. Now, there is an invitation. If you resonate with the information and want to hop on a call with me and talk about working together, go ahead and do that. But if you don't, go ahead and watch the free masterclass and use information. It'll help unscrew your mind a little bit with all the craziness that's out there. So where do you go to find that? You go to legendarylifepodcast.com slash free. That's legendarylifepodcast.com slash free. All right, so let's get into it with Jeff Sanders, the productivity guru and host of the 5 a.m. Miracle Podcast. Jeff Sanders, thanks so much for coming back on, man. It's going to be exciting to catch up with you, my friend. What's up, Ted Rice? Yeah, things are going well. Yeah. Um, you know, we were just catching up before we're hopping on. So much has happened since I last spoke to you. Uh, I was just on your podcast and now you're coming back on mine. You've got a beard growing out. <laughs> You've got a motorcycle on your shirt. What's what's going on with you, man? How have the past uh, couple of years been for you? Just, j- just bring us up to speed a little bit. Well, I think a lot has happened in the last couple of years. Uh, number one, I'm a, a new dad. So a year and a half ago, my wife had our first child. And so being a parent is a radical shift in terms of productivity, in terms of trying to get things done you thought were important and then realizing those things aren't important at all anymore. And so that's been a big shift in terms of prioritization and productivity. I had back surgery about a year ago, which was a big health shift I had for myself. I had bad sciatica that led to the surgery. And there's a long story there. We we, dig out we can. But ultimately, the my life last couple of years has been these big kind of like pinnacle 
life changing moments and me trying to react to those. And I think that you know I'm, I'm 35 now. I'm not 25 like I still have in my brain. And so part of what I've been doing these last couple of years is trying to, I guess, come to terms with the fact that I'm an adult and that I have to do more, I don't know, responsible things. I think for a long time, I've kind of viewed myself as just like a young guy who's like, do whatever he wants. And now I have this like these smack in the face moments where I'm like, no, 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 you're an adult, do adult things. And which is weird to say out loud because it just, it sounds dumb, but yet I am viewing myself differently than I did before. And I think that changes how I approach new projects or how I take on new ventures. It's like, I want to do things on a different level. I love that, man. And I get that vibe from you too, Jeff. And, and it feels good. We've done some great interviews in the past and our audiences have both enjoyed, you know, I've got a lot of listeners who came from your show and my listeners like you as well. And uh, yeah, I would love to just ask you also, so you've had these big life changes. How have you changed as a coach, a productivity guru, if you will? How has your perspective changed on how you help people? And what do you see the real big problem with people and productivity is? Like, how has that changed for you? I think I'm more empathetic than I was before for people who have difficult things going on. I think for a long time, I had this kind of just a mindset based on my own experience, which was that, you know, I've got free time. Like, this is before the child, before I was a dad. It's like, my time is my own. I have all day to do what I want and I'll be very intentional at that time and I'll knock some things off my to-do list. And it was like this bullheaded, like very aggressive, ambitious mentality, which I think could play to your advantage in a lot of ways. If you want to run marathons, build businesses, do big things, it's great. But I think that working with clients the last couple of years, I've realized and, and going through my own personal stuff, it's like people's lives aren't that simple. Things aren't that obvious. And a lot of times I think I have taken the mentality that like, if you're not doing your stuff, it's your fault. I'm gonna, I mean, I'm mad at you. Let me make a plan to fix you. And like, I don't have that approach anymore. That, that's not it. It's, it's much more like I want to find where someone is, meet them where they are, and then help them make progress that makes sense to them, which is totally different for me. It's not saying like, here's the Jeff Sanders perspective. It's like, what's going on in your world? How can I help you based on who you are and what you want? which I think is a different shift because I've been a very like me centric kind of guy for a long time. Sure. And so me too yeah. you know, to reverse that role, I think is, is a big difference for me. And so I, I take that approach more seriously when I have clients and more seriously when I make products and, and, and really try to create content that I think is helpful. Being helpful is a different thing for me now than it used to be. Yeah. And, and it's interesting. I, I've gone through that shift, although I got a few years on you, I've gone through that shift more recently myself, more gone to, I guess, a more extreme shift towards being focused on the other person. And I feel, I want to talk about this with you because I know people do the same thing to you with productivity as they do to me with health and fitness is they try to turn you into the guru, yeah. right? Yeah. And I stop my clients. I'm like, you're guruing me right now. <laughs> Instead of asking me, to answer your question, I'm going to post the, I'm going to put the question back on you. You tell me what the answer is. What do you think it is? Mm. Right? Yeah. And so, uh, have you tried some of that? Have you, yeah. well, uh, what do you think? I think that's oftentimes when people hire coaches, I'm the same way when, if I hire a coach is that the person asking the question, the client, when they ask me for something, they already know what they're going to do. They're just asking for confirmation from me. Like that's really what's going on. They just want me to tell them something they're already thinking, which I think can be very helpful if someone else like outside of your body tells you like, I see this direction in your life and it confirms what you were already thinking. A lot of people that gives them the sense of confidence to then move forward on that same idea. So that they, they just need someone else to say it and like, and hear them. Uh, that's a big part of it. The other thing to the guru aspect, it's like some people just want someone else to do their life for them. But it was someone else that right. the answer. And it's like, oftentimes you are your own guru. Like that's, that's it. You know your own answer. You don't need someone else to confirm it if you are in touch with what's going on. But I think oftentimes you need a coach just to like, I don't know, get thoughts out of your head, bounce some ideas off somebody else and, and just see where that can take you. But yeah, I don't want to be a guru. That's not my intention. I, I don't have all the answers. I don't want to be that guy. And oftentimes that's not even the approach to take anyway. 
Yeah. And I'm curious, what is your method or how do you get people to start trusting themselves and getting in touch with their truth instead of trying to externalize it to you? What do you do there? I think mostly that's asking a lot of questions. If I can get someone talking a lot, they will, over time, the more you ask them questions, they'll end up verbalizing a lot of what they're thinking and experiencing. And if I'm if I'm listening closely enough, I can hear this like common threads that keep popping out, words that they use. And from that, be able to say like, well, you've been saying this word over and over again. Like you obviously have strong emotions tied to that. Let's dig into that. So there's a lot of, it's not like therapy, but it's more, more so just me listening closely and asking a lot of questions because people will just, they'll spill their guts over time if you let them. They'll just, they'll keep talking. And that is where you get to kind of the gold mine of what it means to find someone's motivations and emotions that are then tied to the change that happens later on. Yeah. And, you know, it brings up something like when, if I'm a person, now obviously you're a coach, I'm a coach. And, my greatest learning lessons have not been through reading books or through, you know, even some of these discussions with experts like yourself. It's been through talking to my clients and listening. You really get inside if you're really paying attention and asking the right questions. But if I'm listening to this and and I have coaches and we can even talk about that. I'm curious. Um, I'm curious about like what your your approach is. Uh, to to seeking help uh, or guidance. But if I'm listening to this and I'm like, you know, coaching, uh, asking questions, do I want someone asking questions and do I really want to answer? Do I really see the value in that? And um, of course, we're not going to convince anybody to that coaching is a good thing, right? Even though it's freaking amazing and the key to unlocking whatever level of life you want to unlock, whether that's a coach like you or me or a relationship therapist or et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, you know, what would you say to someone who doesn't immediately hear what you just said and, and, and find value in it as like, Oh wow, this coaching thing is really like a next level sort of breakthrough experience that I could have. I think a lot of people who haven't experienced breakthroughs like that through coaching don't know what it is. This is pretty common, I think, with a lot of things. It's like if I told someone, you know, I ran a marathon and it felt fantastic and I'm in the best <laughs> and, like, and like the feeling of, of crossing the finish line is just epic. If you have no interest in marathons, you might just think I'm a crazy health nut who's just on this weird level that you're not on. And it may sound so foreign that you can't relate to it. I think oftentimes that's what happens to a lot of people who I find this in the world of personal development a lot where, you know, for a long time, all I did was read books, go to conferences, do podcast interviews. I was just like consuming like a madman, like trying to learn all that I could. And if you're not in that frame of mind where you want to absorb things and learn things and grow that it just seems like some silly activity that's just almost like entertainment as opposed to a growth mindset and a lifestyle. So I feel like if you are if you look at someone who's being coached and you think like, well, that's for somebody else. Like they they need a therapist, they need some help. But it's like, yeah, but so do you. Like we all need that kind of like the gem that happens in those moments. And if you don't if you don't see it yet, you need to experience it on some level to get a taste of what that is, to then be able to to relate to it personally. And then you can dig it further. But I think that people need personal experience with things to be able to make those kind of mental leaps to, to then say to themselves, oh, I could experience you know, an amazing you know, breakthrough with that. But if you don't have anything kind of on your own like level of experience to relate to, it just sounds foreign. It sounds weird. It sounds like someone else's game. And so oftentimes, like, that's the hardest thing is getting someone to make that leap. So obviously, if I'm trying to find clients, it's easier to find someone who already knows they love to be coached. Like that's the right. you know, that's obviously great. But if someone doesn't, it's like they need a personal experience in their life somehow that ties them to that. Yeah. You know, though, it's like, don't we all have that, though? Like, weren't we all coached by our parents on on bicycles? Hey, I fell off. Oh, well, get back on and keep riding. You, you'll get it or coached when we were first started walking. Aren't you coaching your kid? There's so many instances in life, but I think we don't see the connection between like when we hit, we, we have coaches as children, our parents, we have, and sometimes they're, hopefully they did a good job. In a lot of cases, maybe not so, 
great. And if we played sports, we had coaches there. If we were in school, maybe our professors were coaching us, maybe mentoring is a better word in that context. And then we get out into the adult world and it's like, there's this sort of myth of adulthood. Like you were saying, like you're finally hitting your stride as an adult. And it's like the myth of adulthood is that like you finally made it to where you don't need any help. You're an adult now. You do things on your own now. And the people who struggle the most are the ones who are trying to figure everything out. And so, man, who are you working with right now for you? I've got a, a business coach right now. It's a guy that lives here, actually here in Nashville with me. He's older than me, which is intentional. I like to find people who are smarter than me and more experienced. Uh, and also people who have very different experiences than me. So I think this is one thing that, you know, I've got a business. I, I want to grow it over time. I have these goals for myself. Uh, but I think oftentimes, like, like you're just saying, like you try to figure things out on your own. It's like I've realized very quickly that like my level of experience and knowledge only goes so far. And I, I can't see the things I can't see, but somebody else can. So I can find someone else who's like been down these roads before for a long time. All of a sudden, they can look at my business, as small as it may be, and say, I see how this could grow in the future. I, I see potential in areas that you're missing completely. And so for me, it's like I'm looking for those kinds of insights, just the, my blind spots, essentially. Like, what am I missing? Because I feel like oftentimes, like I, you know, I'm in the minutia every day, doing my task list, doing my projects. I'm like very inside my own brain. So to have somebody else who can kind of take the bigger step back and see my life for what it is, my business for what it is, that's a perspective that's really hard for me to to get on most days. What would you say is the biggest learning lesson, breakthrough moment that you've had working with your business coach? Well, I think ultimately it's that looking at my business and saying it could be something that you don't see. So it's like if I see another business, like I'm, like, I'm a public speaker. That's one of my goals to grow that over time. And so my business coach looks at other public speakers and says, well, they're doing all of these things that are working well for them. And you're doing none of those things. Like just cop, oh. just do what they're doing. Just lean into that. And I feel like oftentimes it's as simple as that sometimes. Like we just think like we're playing our own game, doing our own thing. And oftentimes just what somebody else has already done, the path is already laid for us. We just have to go do it. And then we get those same results for ourselves. I find that that often, that's how I built my business to begin with. I, was, I found people like Michael Hyatt, you know, who are building these awesome podcasts and businesses. And they're like, well, I'm just going to do what he's doing. And then over time, I kind of just, I lost a sense of what it means to to learn from other people in the way that I should have been learning from them. I, I kind of I like you, you lost that. Well, yeah, because when you, were just, you were just saying like adults think they could do it themselves and they don't need help. Right. I think I, over time, the more experience that I had, the more I convinced myself that I didn't need help as well. So I fell into that, my own trap in that sense. Cause I, I know that's not the right answer, but yet it just kind of happened anyway. And then, so I think to that degree, that's an even greater argument for why we need, assistance and uh, and life in a lot of areas because we just have these tendencies that just over time just sneak in whether it's a poor diet or a lack of you know discipline or whatever the thing is like we all have those tendencies and so to have someone to point that out to us uh, is is really helpful yeah you know it's so true and i'm working with a few different people right now actually but i think uh probably most relevant would be so have you seen my photos like any of the recent photos? Not recent, no. Okay, so I've, I'm I'm like un, around ten ish, if not under ten percent body fat right now. Holy cow! So yeah, I'm, I'm I've got veins on my abs <laughs> popping out. So I hired a nutrition coach. And the guy's amazing. He's he's not only amazing at what he does, he's an amazing person. And interestingly enough, because uh, I'm like you, I actually I'm working with someone on relationships. And he's a bit older, and I feel like I really love that that older brother or uncle vibe. You know, with with this particular guy in relationships, I feel like I, he's more of an older brother the way he talks to me. I, I feel like, especially, I don't know about you, but man, sometimes I feel like I'm the rock in so many people's lives. It's like, who's my rock? Right. You know. Right. And so, uh, working with him. Uh, has been a, a big game changer and helping me. He said something really Im important uh, that I want to share and see, just bounce this off of you and see how it makes you feel. Sure. But 
uh, you're good with relationships. You're good. You're a good communicator, great communicator, I would say. <laughs> you know, I've always looked up to you as a, a speaker, a better speaker than I am, you know, a better communicator than I am. And I really have always appreciated that about you. And so this, this guy, Rory, he said something very interesting. He's like, look, a lot of people will master the game of money. A lot of people will master their health. They'll get ripped. They'll, you know, big build muscles or whatever, run, run marathon, whatever it is. But the people who master relationships, those are the people that I want to have over to dinner. Mm. Those are the people that I want to have relationships with. I want to build something with. I want to spend time with those people because it makes, because they feel comfortable with themselves and that puts other people at ease. And um, I thought that was so powerful, you know? It is. Well, I think that is, I've seen that a lot. And there's no doubt that I, I have one experience is back way in high school. I remember I was, I did a lot of theater. I have a degree in theater as well. So a big part of my growing up was like all these performances and being around what I would call like really. That makes sense, man. Well, yeah. That, that makes sense. Yeah. So, but I was around a lot of these, you know, really talented people, like singers and actors and dancers. And so I've been exposed to a lot of these amazing people. And there's a huge difference between the talent who is a good human being and the talent who's just an egocentric just I'm on my own kind of mission here. And the people that were really talented, but also had a big ego and were hard to get along with, over time, you would see they wouldn't get the role they wanted. They wouldn't be able to, like the directors would see it. The other cast members would see it. Like people could recognize very quickly, like, I don't like that person. I don't want to be around. Them. I don't care how good they are. I don't care how awesome they would be. I don't care if they're the best you know, performer we've ever seen. They're hard to work with. They're hard to be around. So we're just going to opt out. And I, th that was my first experience, like really blatantly seeing that in my life. I was I'm probably 15 years old. This went down. And since then, it's been very clear as well that the people who are the most friendly, the most open, the most willing to talk to you, it's like you don't care how successful they are in other areas of their life. If you like them, if you connect with them, if there's that vibe and that resonance, it's like that's what you you want to surround yourself with people that respect themselves, respect you. And that, that is not usually not even tied to money or success or fitness. Like it's just a, a personality and it's an openness that, you know, I, I don't have that in a lot of ways. I, I, when I see it in somebody else, I'm like, I need to, you know, resemble that. I want more of that in my life. What do you mean you, you don't have that? Well, I think, I think I've become kind of a loner over time. The more that I've worked on my own, and so if I go out oh. to a party, if I go out to a big group, like I'm not going to be the guy that walks around every person in the room and shakes their hand. Like that's not like I'm, I might sound extroverted right now on this podcast interview, but like in a, in an actual like social you know, experience, I, I'm just, I don't, I hang back more. And I think that's for a long time, that wasn't me, but over, over time I've become more reserved, which is bizarre because I never thought that that was who I was. But I am. I'm just I'm a little more introverted than I ever thought that I would be. So I have to kind of relearn to be more open when I'm out like that. Wow. Interesting. That's not what I would have guessed. I don't think that anyone listening right now would have guessed that about you. That's very interesting. As, as people get older, I think that you you fall into I don't call them traps, but you fall into habits. And like depending on like the job you have, the people you're around you know, you end up kind of becoming someone, whether you realize it or not. I think that a big thing I've realized is that if I want to be someone different, I have to change the way I live every single day. Like I can't, like, like right now, like I'm talking to you when we're done with this call, I'm not going to see another human being today until my wife gets home from work. And so it's going to be basically me by myself in my office working, which is great for productivity. It's awesome to get stuff done, but there's a lack of a social connection that I'm very aware of now. And so I need in my life to figure out ways to kind of get around that, restructure how I work and who I work with. And I think that that, that sense of awareness I didn't have for a long time. And so just over time, I found myself becoming more isolated. And that's an area of my life that I want to fix. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, if we're in, uh, if we're in sharing mode, uh, what well, uh, what are you taking? What do you? What steps are you taking to to fix that? Well, people around like like small groups I could join. Uh, there's like you know a running club that meets nearby that I'm probably gonna end up you know hanging out with. It's like just I want to be a part of those kinds of groups where people meet regularly and like that. That's hard to find sometimes as an adult. You can go like an adult like learning class or painting class. Like there's 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 things to do to kind of be more social. That sounds kind of weird, but at the same time it's like 
if I can find people around me that are doing things that I enjoy and I can connect with them on that level, it's like, that's what I'm looking for. I'm not going to say that I've made great strides in this area yet, but like, I know of things I can, steps I can take. And so for me, 2020 and the next year, it really, I, it, part of it's going to be, you know, public speaking on the business side. And the other part of that is like social awareness on the personal side. So it's much more like getting out of my shell, getting out of my office kind of experience. I would even argue for us to really come into our power, for lack of a better word, and our power for good is what I mean here. We have to address those areas that we're not stepping up in, I would, I would argue. You know, for me, for me, it's been, you know, I, I talk such a tough game sometimes, you know, and I'm hard on people in a tough love way. And I'm, I'm very cura- courageous in, in many ways. And I started to ask myself, like, hmm, what am I afraid of addressing? Because there's this quote I love from Joseph Campbell. The cave that you fear to enter holds the treasure that you see. Mm. Yeah. And so everything that you're comfortable doing, like, oh, well, I'll go, I'm going to go do this. I'm comfortable with doing that. It's like, eh, it doesn't hold the treasure. And people go for what's comfortable because it feels comfortable. <laughs> And so I started asking myself, like, what is that that I'm afraid of? Like, I, I've done so many crazy things. I, I, As you know, I've been in Asia for the past two years. I, I didn't have enough money in the bank account. I didn't have enough. My business, you know, you, you've done better business-wise. You've been more, um, now we're, we're crushing it, right? <laughs> but when we left, it wasn't doing well. Mm. And I was ma- making most of my money from... Uh, from personal training. And so we burnt the ships, Jeff, Mm. and had very little just the desire to achieve and succeed. And we, and trust in ourselves, belief in ourselves that we could do it. And also, like you said, you, you made a good point earlier. It's not like I'm not inventing something new. I'm following in the path of people who've done it before. So I'm not really, I'm not a pioneer. I'm not that courageous, right? But for me, uh, I would say that the biggest area was my relationship with my wife. Mm. Uh, I started working with someone for me. And so like showing up in my relationship differently has been my biggest uh, roadblock, biggest fear also. Mm. Because it's like, uh, you know, we have this thing and it's kind of working and I was afraid to mess with it. But the truth was when I started doing that, when we, when we both started working on our shit, in other words, mm-hmm. that actually coincided with this. I mean, other things too, but business started getting better very quickly, hmm. you know, for us. And it seems so unrelated. And I would even say this too, man, you know, with my clients, Sometimes people will come to me, they're like, okay, so what should I eat here? I'm not losing weight. I'm just I'm crazy. What should I? And I'm like, what, what's going on here? Well, I just, I, I binge eat sometimes. And I'm like, you're binge eating. Okay. So why are you feeling that way? Like what's is, cause if, if something like that's happening, then it's usually, do you have like some deep shame about something? Mm. Do you have a lot of anxiety about something? Or do you feel disconnected? Because we have this epidemic going on of disconnection. You know, we've got a, you know, however many thousands of friends on Facebook and followers on Instagram. And but do you, what what real connections do you have? And so she shared with me. She's like, well, you know what? I have a lot of anxiety. I'm very anxious. And I'm like, well, what are you anxious about? And she's like, you know, I have this issue with my boss. And she's just, I, I, I'm owed a raise and, you know, it's a stressful work environment and she, and my boss, she's not, you know, she, she's got her own issues and I'm having to deal with her issues. And how many times does that happen? You know, like we're in a work situation and we're just like, what do I do with this person? But I, we had a talk about it and, um, I, I never would have done this before. And I guess this is me answering that question that I asked you earlier, how, how have I changed helping people? And I said, you know, I want you to have a conversation because you were due a raise. And if you don't address this issue, there's no amount of eating clean or exercise that's going to fix it. It's just an escape Yeah, because the intention is to escape 
the problem instead of the intention to get in shape. And so she went and did that and she ended up getting a raise. And then she ended up breaking through and she she hit her her goal weight in two months, you know, instead of my my coaching, my group coaching's three months. She hit her goal weight in two months mm. and she's on top of the world. And I would argue, you know, so many people think like, well, if that scale just said the right number, I would be happy. If the, if I just looked in the mirror and saw what I wanted to see, uh, if I were more organized, if I just had Jeff Sanders in my life, you know, I would be happier. If I were more productive, I would be happier. But the truth is, it really has to do with that intention. And um, if we're running away from something and not stepping up and dealing with it, it's going to show up and it's going to be a baggage that holds you back. It's going to be that psychic debris that just makes it so hard to see and think clearly. Have you found that with your own clients as well? Oh, certainly. I think to a certain degree, I saw a lot of this. This is probably like 10 years ago when I was running a lot of marathons. Specifically that because when I saw people who were really great like endurance runners, they were like fell into like one of three camps. They're either running from something, running towards something, or they were just like living in the moment. And those oh. living in the moment seem to be the happiest. Those who were running from something had like this like anger about them. Like they were like fe- fearful <laughs> as they were running versus those who were running towards something where it felt like they were like ambitious and like fighting for something they didn't have. And I, I saw this like, play out in my own life as well as I was kind of running more. And I was thinking like, there's so much emotion tied to why we do things. And if your rationale for doing something is misplaced or isn't a healthy place, then your outcomes suck. And you don't, even if you get what you thought you wanted, you're not content with that. It doesn't bring you joy. You know, you cross the finish line and you're like, I feel empty. And you're just like, what happened? Why was that not fulfilling? Because you did it for all the wrong reasons. And you weren't like connected with the why in, in a healthy way. And I feel like that's, that's such an important aspect of like what brings about not just change, but like positive change and like beneficial change and the kind of change that lasts long term. And then that's the hard work, like the emotional like work that you do is the only work that actually means anything long term. You know, that, like, that's the thing. It doesn't matter how many boxes you check and you know, trying to be productive or marathons that you've run. It's like if you're out there fighting and you just hate everything about it, it's like it's because you're doing something wrong. Like you, you missed the boat that back on, on square one. So you got to go back to the beginning and like rework it and like connect with why you're doing something. And then all of a sudden it's easy. All of a sudden you're running and you feel good. You're like, you're, or you're doing your, your job and things are, b- are better. I just, the emotional connection has to be there in a healthy way, which is what people run from. That's what we try to avoid doing because we know it might be painful initially, which it often is. But that's, you just just mentioned the idea that like when you go into that cave, you're avoiding, like it might be initially scary or initially hard, but then you have those quick breakthroughs and realizations of like, oh, this is where I was supposed to be the whole time. Like this is the actual like good stuff. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I love that. I love that example you gave with the runners, like running towards something and they felt like they didn't have, they don't, they don't have something they need to achieve it. And then the people are running from something really angry or maybe fearful, right? Because the anger is like, oh, well, angry, anger is a more uh, powerful emotion than fear. But why are you running, you know, if you're so powerful and angry, right? And, but those people who are in the moment, where did you fit in? initially I was just really excited about it. So I was running towards something like I wanted to check the box. Like that's just kind of my life story is like, I want to check boxes. Like that's why I do productivity. Like I like the idea of having this kind of to-do list that's been, been done. Um, and it took me a long time. I, th- I, had to, I literally had to run, get injured and then restart running again to get to a healthier place. Because when I got injured, I broke my foot actually. And my foot was broken. I couldn't run for six months. And so when I came back to running, I had a very different kind of mentality about it. And I wasn't running to break records. I wasn't running to win a race. I wasn't running to beat anybody else. I wanted just to run just to feel the wind on my face and to feel the, you know, to be outside, breathe fresh air, to just get the joy of running. And so when I took away the competition aspect, took away the, the fight and the anger emotions I used to have with the running, then I could just let it be what it is and just enjoy it and then get benefits from that. And that's, that's when I began to run better. 
Like that's what I began to feel better as I ran. And so it's just, you have to let go of that kind of just, um, for me, the bullheaded mentality of like, I'm going to go check boxes. Now I have also seen like, not my own life directly, but a lot of runners who are successful are those who are running from something. A lot of times I have trauma and they're trying to deal with their trauma through physical activity. Like they are extreme endurance athletes because you know they lost someone in their life, they lost a business, they lost something, and they think that they can fulfill that void with athletic activity. And I find yeah. they're some of the most that's me. people. Or was me. And that's yeah. a tough place to be in because I get it that exercise brings fulfillment. I, I That's why I love to work out because I feel better when I do it. But it's not, an, it, it's an escape, but it's not the solution to something that really is the problem. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it's, you're very astute, Jeff, to notice that. And, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're wise beyond your years. <laughs> well, thank you. But yeah, you know, I, that's how I got into martial arts. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to rehash my story now. I've, I've told it so many times, but the traumas that I've been through, I spent a long time doing martial arts or even lifting weights real aggressively, um, trying to get away from something and, um, really trying to get away from the feelings inside. And in the process, kept injuring myself and injuring myself. It's, now I'm in this place. I'll tell you, I, I even still had a little bit of that. It, it, moving to Asia changed me in that way, uh, fundamentally. And also some other things. I would say the biggest change, even though I'm 42 years old, have been in the past couple of years that I've been in Asia. So where I was training martial arts in uh, back in Miami Beach, there were a lot of those guys, Right. That's who kind of shows why why are you showing why are you showing up to a, a place and fighting other guys, right? Like what what's behind that exactly? Now it's not all of us or, or some people just it, it it's not like that. It's such a popular thing now. But when I first started, it was more underground for sure. And uh, you know, why are we doing this? And a lot of it, you you're you're with the same sort of types of guys. And what I learned in Asia coming here and in Thailand particularly and training Muay Thai here, which is the Thai form of kickboxing that revolutionized mixed martial arts. If you train mixed martial arts, you do American wrestling, you do Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and you do Muay Thai kickboxing because if you don't do those things, then you can't even, you're not even in the game. You can't, you can't compete. You got to at least know the basics there. And what I've learned from training with these Thai guys is, and I put up videos sometimes, when they're sparring with each other, they're playing with each other. They don't go so hard and it's so beautiful to see. And these are guys too that come from, um, you know, a lot of people don't understand the culture in Thailand, but the Muay Thai guys, they come from poor areas. It's not, it's not like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a businessman, but I do Muay Thai. Those guys are doing Taekwondo, right? Actually, in, in, in Thailand. They don't, they don't do their own sport because of the sort of lower social class uh, hierarchy, hierarchical sort of perspective they have here. But these guys, they have been fighting for so long. Some of them have 300 fights, Jeff. Wow. 200 fights. And so these are guys who've who've been through that hundreds of times in some cases these these battles literally in the ring these battles and um they're some of the nicest guys and th you you play with them and you're sparring with them and you see these and they can they can be very small 120 pounds 130 pounds and you see them take apart bigger guys and again playing you know, and that really changed things uh, for me. And and not just the trauma, running away from the trauma, but sometimes in America, I feel like for guys like you, for example, the box checkers, like it's all in this, what, what my friend and, and mentor Peter Sage calls like, uh, by me, everything is done by me, mm. right? There's this victim mode where it's to me. Everything's happening to me. Why is this happening to me? And then there's by me. I can do things now. I, I have power now. Let me go do things. Let me run the marathon. Let me check the boxes. 
But there's this other level that is that he calls at least through me, right? Uh, which you know, if you're into ancient Chinese uh, philosophy, there would be Uwe, right? To be effortless in in the moment, or what uh, you know, if you're into Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's work, the Hungarian psychologist, it would be flow states. Mm. And and what you were talking about with the runners, the ones who are the happiest, they're in the moment running just for, for the pleasure of, like you said, feeling the wind in their face, feeling the all you know the sun or just being outside in nature and and just enjoying that moment. Man, that's that's been a big shift for me since I since I left the States. Yeah, it's, and it's huge. I mean, the idea of being in a flow state or being in the moment, it's you, I, I, my perspective is like, I want to check the boxes to get there, but it's not a thing you work for. It's a thing you almost just like let happen to you. It's like, you just kind of, you just walk into it. It's not something you have to like, really like, you know, get yourself fired up to experience. Like oftentimes it's just like, if you just let the, the thing come to you, it's there. And I think that oftentimes it's just a, an awareness. It's like, look around, like you can be in a flow state all the time. You can achieve that sense of peace. You just, you can't fight your whole life to get there. Like, that's been part of my story. And that's one thing I've been working on in a lot of ways. Running is a great example of it, but it's also apl applies to when you're working, when you're talking to someone, as opposed to just like, you know, well, I've got a list of things we're going to go through today. It's like, no, let's just, let's just have a conversation, you know, it's, which is a very different perspective and one that, when you can have those in a genuine way, like experience life in that flow state more often, like things are easier. Things don't have to be so hard. Not everything is a fight. And I think that for me, I, I have viewed life as a war oftentimes. Like I've got to win. I've got to do stuff. I've got to you know make these things happen. But like, that's exhausting, man. It's just, you know, like, so exhausting. That's not how I want to wake up every morning is feel like I have to go beat up somebody, you know, or myself. <laughs> like that's not it. And so, yeah, it's, that for me is is where I'm I'm heading towards and getting better at, which is experiencing more of those flow states. Yeah, is that something you work with uh, people on as well? Yeah, I mean, oftentimes that's for most people the flow state thing is hard if you just are just overly busy. You have way too many things you're trying to do, which is that same kind of you know, back of your head mentality of I have to check all these boxes. It's like oftentimes no, like you can erase half your to do list and your life's actually going to get better, not worse. And that's hard for people to understand if you think that your life and your value is determined by all that progress. If you think that your only real, like, you know, the reason why you exist is to have more achievements on your belt or more. Hey, Jeff. You back? Oh, so speaking of flow states and then cutting off the conversation. I know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, whoa, you just ruined the flow state. So anyway, we're back. <laughs> but yeah, could you finish up your thoughts about the the flow state? And so oftentimes what I see, my clients especially, but also just people who are high achievers and those who think that, you know, their value is tied to the progress that they're making in life. They think that if they have these boxes checked, that that means success, that means happiness, that means fulfillment. But what I find is like letting go of those check boxes, letting go of that to-do list, letting go of the responsibilities that people think they have to have on their list or on their calendar or in their life. Like the real, like the happiness, the joy, the flow states that come in, those happen when you don't feel the sense of like, I have to be on 24 seven. I have to be doing things more and more and more. It's that letting go of that necessity of doing allows you to then just be in a sense of just being and just existing and living. Like The flow states don't happen because you checked more boxes. Those happen because you let go of the check boxes. Like You have to f get to a place where you allow yourself to do less, and that's only when you actually can do more of the things that matter. And that's a hard place to get to for a lot of people because we get so emotionally tied to just being busy. And that's oftentimes the biggest struggle. Yeah, it's very counterintuitive. You actually sound like uh, like like an Eastern philosopher now, <laughs> with a very American voice. There you go. <laughs> it's like you want to achieve more, you have to let go of achieving more to achieve more. You know. Well, and in a sense, people kind of relate this to the idea of like if you want to I mean, grow a business or improve some area of your life. Oftentimes, you have to let go of all the things that aren't working, and then you focus in a very acute, focused way on just a couple of things that can, over time, scale. And so, and in my last book, I had this I, this concept I used called the green pen strategy, which is essentially where you know 
if you were in school and your teacher looked at your paper you wrote and they have a red pen and they cross all your mistakes out and they, they, they fill it up with all these, you know, you messed up here and here and here. And so then you go back and you erase those mistakes. And then what's left over is like a hodgepodge thing that should be better in theory. And it kind of is. But the green pen that I like more is you look through what you created and find all the areas that are awesome, that stand out as amazing. And you pull those things out by themselves and let the rest of it go. And the few things that are amazing, you then grow and expand upon those ideas. You let those parts of your life that are going well be your whole life. And so the things that you thought were important before just kind of fade away are the things that really matter get your center stage in your life. And so that's what I try to do with my business, with my health, with areas of my life where I'm struggling. Like what is going really well? What has great potential? And how can I just lean on those things and that's oftentimes a smaller to-do list. It's shorter, it's easier, and more focused. And then that's when you actually experience more success down the road. Yeah, that is so brilliant, Jeff. And man, you know, I feel like we could keep going, but I think that's a beautiful place to end it. And what would you say if you had to give, if you had to say, you know what, to, to the listeners, this is the one thing I want you to take away from today and apply into your life? Cut stuff. Let go of things that aren't working. I think that if you want to find a sense of relief, like I love to cancel appointments. I love to look at my calendar and say, that's not going to happen. And that's not going to happen. Because <laughs> when, that, when, that, when that takes place, when I cancel stuff, all of a sudden I have this free space on my calendar and I get really excited about that because wait a minute, I have an hour of my day I didn't think I thought I had before. What could I do with that time? And then all of a sudden my brain starts going and ideas start moving. And I feel like that, the sense of creativity and, and enthusiasm that comes from that only happens when you allow that space to exist to begin with. And so you have to almost artificially go through your life and remove things so you do have that mental space and that, and that creative space to then figure out the best use of that time, which oftentimes leads you to doing things that are more, more fulfilling, that are better and healthier. But it takes that willingness to cut stuff, uh, which is oftentimes kind of difficult at first, but then it's really fun. We do a lot of it. Jeff, I want to tell you, you just inspired me right now. I've got these two interviews scheduled in January, and I'm just like, it's just not really appropriate. I've got so many coaching clients right now and things just kind of blew up because it's that time of year and I really need to focus on serving them the best way that I can. And I've been like, no, but maybe I should try to do it all. So thank you for inspiring me today and giving me actionable advice because after we hang up with this, I'm going to go cancel those two appointments, man. <laughs> and I already feel mentally lighter. There you go. Yes. Just thinking, yes. you know what? I'm just going to get rid of I'm just going to cancel. I'm just going to apologize and say, you know what? I just, I, I apologize because I'm the one that reached out and asked, but sometimes we, you know, just have to do what we have to do and for, for our, ourselves and, and for our bigger purpose, if you will. Um, so thank you so much for today. And thank you personally uh, for inspiring me for that. And I want, if you're listening right now, I want you to take Jeff's information, Jeff's actually, I shouldn't say information, but brilliant wisdom, brilliant, actionable wisdom, and think about what you're going to cut. Because your life, if you are crazy busy, that could be just another way of escaping what you really need to do. Jeff, it's been a pleasure. Where would you like the listeners to go for the people who are new uh, to you uh, and just hearing you for the first time? Where would you like people to go to connect with you further? Well, the best place for most people is my podcast, The 5 a.m. Miracle, which you can find everywhere podcasts are found. Um, also, the website, jeffsanders.com. I've got links to all of my you know, online courses and newsletters and all that fun stuff. But uh, the podcast, you know, it's free and uh, people tend to like it the most. So I say start there, uh, dig into the content there and see where it takes you. Yeah. And uh, we've had so many great people go back and forth. So if you're looking for some real productivity advice, not how to check more boxes, but how to get focused on the fundamentals, definitely check out or, or not the fundamentals necessarily, but the things that really are effective and move the needle in your life. Go check out the 5 a.m. Miracle. We'll have the, the link for that in the show notes and jeffsanders.com. Jeff, it's a pleasure like always. Man, you rocked it today. Thank you so much for coming on and uh, 
Can't wait to connect with you again soon. Awesome. Thanks, Ted. Appreciate it. That wraps up another episode of the Legendary Life Podcast. And I hope you enjoyed that episode with Jeff. We just had a real conversation instead of the listicle sort of like five things to improve your productivity type of podcast that we or that I've done in the past. I just want to have more real conversations about the struggles to let you in behind the scenes a little bit to show you that we're people like everyone else. We struggle like everyone else. We have our strengths. We have our weaknesses, just like you have your strengths and you have your weaknesses, but also to give you some perspective on your life and hopefully some inspiration and actionable things that you can put into play to take yourself to the next level, because that's what it's really all about. That's what living a legendary life is really all about, taking action on what you learn. Life is about experiences, not uh, being able to argue theories on Facebook with people you don't know. So I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to do more shows like that. In fact, it's going to be a new standard of mine where if I can't have a really great conversation with someone that I know is going to touch you emotionally and perhaps inspire you and give you actionable information to put into play in your life, I'm going to try to avoid those people. Even if they have a big following, that's my commitment to you and to helping you live that better life, empowering you to live that better life, that legendary life. And again, if you're looking to lose fat and optimize your energy, I've been helping people with that since 1999. And we're in 2020, baby. So if that's something that you're interested in, check out my free masterclass at legendarylifepodcast.com slash free. If you're new to the show, you should know that there's nothing to buy on the on the masterclass. It's not going to try to upsell you to a $97 product or anything like that. It's just free information. It'll help you get clear on what you need to be doing to get the results that you want from your fat loss program, from your health program, from your workouts, from your nutrition. And you go to legendarylightpodcast.com slash free. Uh, there is an invitation at the end to hop on a call with me to do a breakthrough call and perhaps end up working together. But you don't need to take action on it. In fact, I don't want you to take action on it unless it resonates with you, unless you're the type of person who's ready for that level of commitment to transforming your body and your health. Otherwise, just use the information and put it into action in your life. Reap the rewards. So again, that's legendarylightpodcast.com slash free. And in case you've seen previous masterclasses, this new one is, uh, or this new one is new. A little redundantly hyperfluous there, but it's a new masterclass. So if you haven't checked it out in the past month or so, you want to check out this masterclass. All right. Hope you enjoyed it. Have an amazing week and I'll speak to you on Friday.